Hello and welcome to Mariology. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. In this lecture, we seek to synthesize the profound and sublime Mariology of St. Maximilian Kolbe. Insofar as the development between the Holy Spirit and Mary, it can be said that no one did more to clarify the relationship of the Holy Spirit and the Blessed Virgin Mary than St. Maximilian Kolbe. Now, I want to bring up an element of his historical background that deeply influenced his Mariology. Most of us are familiar with his experience as a child where after a reprimand from his mother, he went to the chapel and had a vision of Our Lady offering him two crowns, white crown of purity, red crown of martyrdom, and at the young age, uh, young Raymond said, I I'll take them both. Then, of course, his heroic death in Auschwitz, saying, I am a Catholic priest, when identifying himself as who would dare to step out of rank and offer his life to take the place in sacrifice in the hunger bunker for a married man who had been designated to be one of the ten to suffer for an escaped prisoner. So that's well known. And also his great love for marrying consecration is well known. What is less known is a historical event that happened when he was a seminarian in Rome that would deeply affect his Mariology and what we might call the extremely evangelical and active dimension of the Mariology of St. Maximilian Kolbe. And that was this event when in October of 1917 he was walking home from his classes at the Gregorianum and he passed by the Piazza San Pietro, the St. Peter's uh, Square, the piazza there. In the piazza was an unsolicited demonstration by Freemasonry. And the sign over the demonstration read, Satan must reign in the Vatican and quote, the Pope will be his slave. There was also a large banner of having Satan crushing the head of St. Michael the Archangel. Well, this so stirred Brother Maximilian at the time that he went home and he established that which would be known as the Militiae Immaculate, or the, the Army of the Immaculate. So his, his organization, his Marian organization, and, and his Marian vision would also include, in an essential way, spiritual battle against Freemasonry. Now, just so that we properly understand how evangelical and active uh, St. Maximilian was, in fact, his goal was not to simply convert the world, but to return the universe to Jesus Christ through consecration. Consecration is holy property to the Immaculata, the Immaculate One, or His name, the Immaculata for Our Lady. So part of his goal was to spiritually engage in battling Freemasonry. So to properly understand that, I just want to give a very brief summation of both Freemasonry and the Church's stance against Freemasonry, because again, it was a major element that shaped his dynamic evangelical Mariology and his willingness to do a type of spiritual warfare as part of the Army of the Immaculate against Freemasonry as a spiritual enemy of the Church. Uh, these were Brother Maximilian's words in, again, the, after that experience he had in St. Peter's Basilica. He said, and I quote, In the face of such attacks of the enemies of the Church of God, are we to remain inactive? No. Every one of us has a holy obligation to personally hurl back the assault of this foe. He would go on to say, uh, This mortal hatred for the Church of Jesus Christ and for his vicar was not just a prank on the part of deranged individuals, but a systematic action proceeding from the principles of Freemasonry. Draw, excuse me, destroy all religion, whatever it may be, especially the Catholic religion. So this is the fervor, the zeal that St. Maximilian uh, had against Freemasonry. 
I just want to give us a, a brief update in terms of what the Catholic Church presently teaches regarding Freemasonry, because we're going to see this in a complete complementarity with the thrust of St. Maximilian and why he believes that bringing in Our Lady to crush the head, not only of Satan, but also of Freemasonry, is an integral part of his Marian vision and, and why he's aiming higher, as he says. He's aiming higher to bring all the universe back to Jesus through Mary in the form of consecration. So I want to make reference to a November 26, 1983 document from the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. This was authored by the then Cardinal Ratzinger, Prefect for the Congregation of Faith, and it was also approved by Pope St. John Paul II. Just reading the, the relevant passage, and again, you can, th this document is obtainable. And I, I say this because there's still uh, a great confusion and perhaps a, 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 a privation of full knowledge of how much the church condemns Freemasonry and why the church condemns Freemasonry. Let me quote from this document from the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. Quote, the negative position of the church in regard to Masonic associations remains unchanged since their basic principles have always been considered irreconcilable with the teachings of the church and consequently membership in them remains forbidden. The faithful who belong to Masonic associations are in a state of grave sin and may not receive Holy Communion. He then goes on to say, quote, the Supreme Pontiff John Paul II in the course of the audience granted to the undersigned Cardinal approved this declaration. So that's very strong language. Uh, the question could be why? What, what exactly is it in Masonry that calls for such a strong reaction to the church? Well, to also buttress not only the uh, position of St. Maximilian Kolbe, but also the present position of the church as found in this Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith statement, I want to go back to an encyclical written by Leo XIII against Freemasonry. This is in his encyclical entitled Humanum Genus. Again, just a quote from a direct expression of the papal magisterium about how dangerous Freemasonry is. Leo XIII will say, and I quote, their chief dogmas are so greatly and manifestly at variance with reason that nothing can be more perverse. To wish to destroy the religion and the church, which God himself has established and whose perpetuity he ensures by his protection and to bring back a lapse after a lapse of 18 centuries, the manners and the customs of the pagans is signal folly and audacious impiety. So, uh, again, very strong words. Why? What, what does Masonry hold that is so radically antithetical to the teachings and the life of the church? Well, I'm going to summarize from one document, uh, which was a document authored by the individual who's oftentimes called the father of American Freemasonry, Albert Pike, his work on dogmas and morals which enumerates some of the positions, and, and this, I think, underscores why the church, and of course, St. Maximilian, so understood that this is far from just a social club. This is far from just an, a, a fraternal uh, association. Uh, this is an institution that has as its goal the undermining of the church, of the papacy, and in a very specific way, the moral and faith teachings of the church. So, for example, Masonry holds, number one, that Jesus Christ is not divine, but an early master mason himself. Number two, Satan is not evil. He is rather a, quote, force, which God created, and not a person at all. Thirdly, there is the requirement of secrecy and fidelity to masonry above the church and family. And without getting into too many of these details, in the first oath, the first vow one must make uh, as an entered apprentice mason, one must vow to put masonry, and in specific the lodge, the local expression of masonry, over faith and family. And that's why right from the initiation of participation in Freemasonry, you're doing an action uh, that would be blasphemous to God and uh, heterodox to faith. 
you of course cannot put any institution above God, the church, and family. So this is kind of a foundational element of why the church is so clear of the evils of Freemasonry. Further teachings of Freemasonry, the only true object of worship is the, quote, great architect of the universe, uh, which is at best a type of enlightenment clockwork God, a God who begins as an uncaused cause, if you will, begins things in actions, but then has no interest and no intervention into the workings of humanity. Masons also hold, by definition, that all religious dogma is subjective and that truth is relative. There's no absolute truth except the truth that is found in Freemasonry. More recently, uh, the Catholic Conference of German bishops in 1996 listed 12 reasons of the incompatibility, the contradictory nature of masonry with the Catholic Church. Uh, these five also summarize why the church is so adamant that you simply cannot be a Catholic and a Mason. First of all, the world view of freedom from any set of religious truths uh, for Masonry. You are sanctified by the Lodge alone. Uh, the Masonic denial of objective truth, as we've discussed, the Masonic notion of God, that you cannot know God personally, and the Masonic idea of perfection, that this is achieved through the Lodge, not through relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and once again, the overall spirituality that you have to have a primary loyalty to Freemasonry. So all of these uh, are absolutely incompatible with the church. St. Maximilian would further state, and I quote, these men without God find themselves in a tragic situation. Such implacable hatred for the church and the ambassadors of Christ on earth is not in the power of individual persons, but of a systematic activity stemming in the final analysis from Freemasonry. In particular, it aims to destroy the Catholic religion. Their deceits have been spread throughout the world in different disguises, but with the same goal. Religious indifference and the weakening of moral forces according to their basic principle, quote, we will conquer the Catholic Church not by argumentation, but rather through moral corruption. So this makes clear the essential kind of metaphysics of Freemasonry, why it is absolutely incompatible. And before we get into the Mariology of St. Maximilian on, on, on the remedy, because for St. Maximilian, the Militia Maculati, his understanding of the relationship between the Holy Spirit and Mary, which hopefully leads us to consecrating ourselves to the Immaculata, is the principal way by which we combat Freemasonry. So St. Maximilian understood that because Masonry has a, a truly evil and diabolical dimension to it, uh, that does come out in the later rites of Freemasonry, that the answer, the remedy, therefore, must be spiritual. And it's in that regard that uh, so much of the concept and the means uh, to formulate the Army of the Immaculate was a response to Freemasonry. So in that norm, let me also say that the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith in that 1983 document went on to say, that individual bishops do not have the jurisdiction to abrogate, that is, to reject or to not follow the directions coming from the Vatican. And this was because in various parts of the world, individual bishops would say, well, in my diocese, there's not a problem. We work together fraternally. We do things for charity together. And the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith is saying that the local ordinary does not have the jurisdiction to uh, deny and therefore to lead to a cooperation with an organization that has as uh, its principal goal to undermine the Vicar of Christ. Uh, these are uh, also manifest in, for example, the 30th level of, of the Scottish Rite Masonry uh, demands that the individual going up higher has to thrust a, a lance into a skull with a papal tiara on it as an indication of their, uh, their uh, rejection and their uh, effort to undermine 
uh, the Vicar of Christ. So, and once again, this is all public knowledge. There's been many public uh, 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 specials on the nature of masonry. This is not from a few texts. This is a, a standard understanding of masonry and therefore why the church has so condemned it. Now, to the remedy. Once again, because St. Maximilian rightly sees Freemasonry as a spiritual evil, his remedy is a spiritual remedy, and that's consecration to the Immaculate. What, though, does he provide as a foundation for this remedy? And, and in what way is St. Maximilian a contributor, a unique contributor to Mariological pneumatology, or the relationship between the Holy Spirit and Our Lady. Well, let's summarize his, his very rich and very sublime theology in a few basic principles. First of all, he asks the question, who is the Holy Spirit? And he will answer that because the Holy Spirit is the eternal example of the fruition of the love between the Father and the Son, he is indeed he who processes from that love that the Holy Spirit becomes the perfect model for all conceptions. That is, the perfect model for the beginning of all life. Now, St. Maximilian, who had his two doctorates, was very clear to make appropriate distinctions. The Holy Spirit, we know, has no beginning. The Holy Spirit is eternal. He has no beginning. He's no, he has no end. He's the third person of the Trinity. Still, St. Maximilian contends, and rightly so, that because he is the fruit, the eternal fruit, the eternal flowering of the love of the Father and Son, he can still be the perfect exemplar for life's beginning. Therefore, he will call the Holy Spirit the, quote, uncreated immaculate conception. And I'm going to put that down for emphasis because this is so much of a, uh, a foundation of his teaching. And uncreated expression being uniquely attributed to Our Lady, how is this justified? Well, let's look at the terms. First of all, obviously the Holy Spirit is uncreated. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is macula means to be without stain. Clearly, can be the model of the beginnings of all life. Even though his had no beginning, he again is the perfect procession, uh, the fruit of the love of the Father and Son. So, the whole question of St. Maximilian, who is Mary? And to respond to this, of course, we know that Our Lady is will draw great theological fruits from Our Lady's self-identification that happens at Lourdes. So on March 25th of 1858, Our Lady reveals to St. Bernadette the words, quote, I am the Immaculate Conception. Now notice, as St. Maximilian points out, Our Lady did not say, believe, in the Immaculate Conception, or it is true to hold the Immaculate Conception. Rather, she said, I am the Immaculate Conception. So St. Maximilian will compare that statement analogously. Let's remember what, anal uh, what a analogy is theologically, right? It's where two things have something essentially the same, but also something essentially different. So St. Maximilian will compare that statement, I am the Immaculate Conception, to the statement found in the Old Testament uh, in, in, in Exodus, in, Exodus in, in the revelation of God, I am who am, which we could say in a philosophical sense, I am existence. 
That is, part of my essence, part of who I am, is existence, that I am. That's the difference, of course, and this is our Metaphysics 101 uh, kind of synthesis, the difference between God and creatures, right? God has existence as part of his essence. We do not have existence as part of our essence. We have to receive that from an uncaused cause. We have to receive that from a being who does have existence as part of his essence. So, as God is revealing in the Old Testament, I am existence, I have it as part of who I am, so too, he says, analogously, that Our Lady's saying, I am the Immaculate Conception, meaning there is something mysteriously essential about Our Lady that means that she's without stain and that she's full of grace. St. Maximilian would hold she's saying something about her very being when she says, I am the Immaculate Conception. I am the full of grace. This goes in a complementary fashion with St. John Paul II's commentary in the Mother of Redeemer, uh, Redemptoris Matra, his, again, his one Marian encyclical, when he says that the Archangel Gabriel changed Mary's name or, or calling her full of grace was an indication of her immaculate conception by her very identity. Uh, he didn't say the angel now, hail Mary, full of grace, but full of grace becomes a reply. Same line of saying there's something truly mysteriously essential about grace and Our Lady, even though we know that grace is theologically an accident. We, we can be a human being and which is essential, right? Body, soul, intellect, will, and not have grace, which is accident as a, in terms of a non-essential quality. So something very profound in this. So for St. Maximilian, who is Mary? She is the Immaculata, someone who by her very being is full of grace. Thirdly, what is the relationship between the Holy Spirit, the uncreated Immaculate Conception, and Our Lady, the created Immaculate Conception. Here, my friends, we're going to find his great historic contribution. St. Maximilian will tell us that the relationship between the Holy Spirit and Mary is certainly spousal. And this is beautifully portrayed, of course, at the Annunciation, where the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary, and the fruit of the relationship between the Divine Spouse, the Holy Spirit, and Mary, the human spouse, is our Lord Jesus. Uh, as, as the uh, local expression is, you don't fix what isn't broken. We're going to see that the Holy Spirit will continue to bring all of His graces through Our Lady because it was so successful the first time. It's called the Incarnation. So first of all, they're spousal. They have a spousal relationship. Saint Maximilian will say, while spousal is true to convey the intimacy between the Holy Spirit and Mary, it's not enough. That it's weak in terms of articulating the full dynamism of the relationship between the Holy Spirit and Mary. And so St. Maximilian will say, if you really want to understand how the Holy Spirit works through Our Lady and with Our Lady, you must compare that relationship, the Holy Spirit and Mary, to the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. Now here we have to make important distinctions, my friends, and certainly Saint Maximilian Kolbe is a saint because he also wasn't a material heretic. He certainly didn't make theological, mirological errors. And that's also because he made the distinctions he needs to convey this truth. So once again, Saint Maximilian's great contribution is that to fully understand the unity between the Holy Spirit and Mary, you have to compare it to the hypostatic union. That, and he will say, that Mary is like the personification of the Holy Spirit. Now notice he's not saying is. That the Holy Spirit uh, manifests himself most richly through the human uh, spouse, the human uh, element of Our Lady, the, the human complementarity of Our Lady. So, St. Maximilian will say, 
it is true to say, number one, the Holy Spirit never became incarnate. Of course, we know that to be a, a, a foundational truth. Number two, that the Holy Spirit and Mary were two separate persons. Now, once again, with those important distinctions, the Holy Spirit never became incarnate, and the Holy Spirit and Mary two separate persons, now let's compare the relationship between the Holy Spirit and Mary to the unity of the divine nature and the human nature in the one divine person of Jesus. So he will teach that as the divinity of Jesus works through his humanity while still being one divine person, so too the Holy Spirit acts only through the Immaculata. St. Maximilian has a famous line where he says, their union is so inexpressible, that is, between the Holy Spirit and Mary, that the Holy Spirit acts only through the Immaculata, his human spouse. So once again, keep in mind that, that analogy that as the divinity of Jesus always works through his sacred humanity, so too the Holy Spirit always works through Mary. Another important distinction, and again, I hope you can appreciate the great saints and their effort to reveal more of the truth about the beauty and the sublime truth about Our Lady. Why the fathers called her a new creation. She's not God. She'll never be God. She's infinitely less than God, but she's a new creation. She is part of humanity, but she is unique among humanity. Even the non-Catholic poets can't resist calling her the human race's solitary boast, in the words of Wordsworth. So in this relationship, the Holy Spirit acts only through Mary in the mediation of graces, not because he has to. So a, a further important distinction is to say there is no inner necessity for the Holy Spirit to act only through Mary. It is rather through divine disposition. Simple terms, because the Holy Spirit desires to. It's because the Holy Spirit wants to. It's because the one time the Holy Spirit acted, we received Jesus, the source of all, and in fact, in his very nature, uncreated grace. So it shouldn't be surprising that as Our Lady then takes on the task to distribute the graces of the redemption with and under Jesus, as she does everything, that the Holy Spirit would choose to distribute all of his gifts of sanctification through his human spouse, through Our Lady. So we can draw up a syllogism. Point A, the Holy Spirit is the divine source and sanctifier of all things. B, the Holy Spirit chooses to act only through Mary, his human spouse. Therefore, see, Mary is the mediatrix of each and every grace of the Holy Spirit. My friends, if we understand this, this really has profound theological and pastoral dimensions because, for example, if we're really seeking Christian holiness, which should, it should be the call of every member of our Holy Catholic faith, if we want the fullness of the Holy Spirit, we receive that through Our Lady. So as great authors like St. Saint, Saint Louis Marie de Montfort would say back in the 17th century, and even theologically, the, the great 19th century theologian Matthias Schaben uh, would say that to receive the fullness of the Spirit, you unite yourself as fully as possible to Our Lady because indeed the Spirit acts only through Mary. And that means the more you give yourself to Our Lady, the more you avail yourself of the graces of sanctification from the Holy Spirit, which gives a wonderful pneumatological or theology of the Holy Spirit background for Marian consecration. So, 
with that understanding, and by the way, there's an excellent work called The Immaculate Conception, excuse me, The Holy Spirit and the Immaculate Conception. It's a summarized work by the Vatican II critic Manto Bonami, uh, but it's an excellent synthesis of St. Maximilian's theology of the Holy Spirit and Our Lady, if you're interested in further study on that. So this all leads, once again, to St. Maximilian's aiming higher, returning the universe to Jesus through consecration to the Immaculata. He'll even say, in terms of the uncreated Immaculate Conception, analogy of spouses that, you know, the, the wife takes on the name of the husband in a sign of that unity. And that's why Mary... ...talk about the intimacy. So, each and every grace that comes from the Holy Spirit comes through the intercession, through the mediation of Mary as his human spouse. And this will be a foundation for a full pneumatology and a full Mariology, but it also leads to the salvation and sanctification of souls, which was Saint Maximilian's ultimate goal. It wasn't first a theological contribution, it was first the saving of souls through consecration to the Immaculata. Now, one final notion to do at least some minor justice, uh, because we're certainly not doing full justice to the genius of St. Maximilian in just this one lecture, but his whole concept of what he called struggling under the banner of the Immaculata. What does he mean that we're called to struggle under the banner of the Immaculata? Well, consecration, and once again, for St. Maximilian, consecration's model was property. For St. Louis Marie de Montfort, it was slavery. And of course, St. Maximilian uh, was alive uh, and was, was asked, uh, you know, why the difference? Why do you use property instead of de Montfort's slavery? Uh, he was asked uh, because of his well-known love for de Montfort. And Colby's response was, I think property connotes more that it's a total gift. It's, a total, it's an unconditional gift you give to Our Lady. But both are substantially a gift without limit of self to Our Lady for this purpose of sanctification. Struggling under the banner of the Immaculata for St. Maximilian meant that consecration is a life. It's not just an act. So just as, again, analogously, the marriage day, the, the, the wedding day, uh, does not suffice to have a healthy marriage 25 years later if you do nothing, if, you, if there's no expression of love, no sacrifice from the moment of the act to 25 years later. The life will be lost, right? And in, in, in not sacramentally, but in terms of the love that has to be there. Well, analogous to that's also true about consecration. If someone says, well, I made the consecration 10 years ago, well then St. Maximilian, I believe, would ask the question, are you living the consecration? Are you trying to do all with, for, in, by the Immaculata? Are you calling upon her as the Mediatrix of all graces, interceding for your needs, both personally of great importance and also the menial tasks of the day? So to struggle under the banner of the Immaculata is to underscore not only that we are supposed to be missionaries in spreading consecration worldwide uh, and the, the, the clearly dynamic evangelical dimension of, of St. Maximilian Kolbe was extraordinary. Founding a, a city, Neopokolanov, uh, having total poverty, having only one lung, living in total poverty, and yet having state-of-the-art printing presses because he knew that evangelization had to use the best of modern means. Uh, at the same time, he realized to struggle under the banner means that you are living your consecration act to Our Lady day after day after day. That's what allows the evangelical dimension, your ability to spread the faith, spread Marian consecration as a supernatural fruit of you living consecration.
So once again, this is only a brief synthesis of, of the genius and the sublimity of St. Maximilian, but at least, God willing, it will uh, whet our taste to, to a greater appreciation of this great saint and this great contributor to Mariology. Thank you so much for being with us in this lecture of Mariology. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli saying, God bless you all, and let's all do our part to bring to life and to love the words of Jesus, to behold our mother. Thank you.